Okay, so in this video, we're going to continue our discussion of, of trademark doctrine by thinking about marks other than word marks. So we'll be talking about device marks and trade dress as well. Uh, and that means uh, product features that can communicate information about source to consumers that don't take the form of a word mark or logo, but are rather the qualities of the product itself. And what we have to look for to determine whether or not uh, particular device uh, devices or, uh, or, or trade dress uh, can actually communicate information about, about source to consumers. In other words, what do we think about? What kind of questions do we ask when we make the determination whether or not the appearance or the, uh, the packaging of a particular product can tell consumers where the product comes from? How do we analyze that? And how does that analysis compare to the analysis of word marks? So the first case we'll look at is Qualitex v. Jacobson. And that involved the question of whether or not color alone could be a mark that uh, that showed the source of a product. So Qualitex had been in the dry cleaning pad business for a long time, and it was the largest provider of dry cleaning pads. And over the period, a long period of time, it had developed a uh, kind of a, a, a trademark color, as it were, this kind of, what they like to call it, green gold of the, uh, of the pad that you see depicted in the, in the photograph in front of you, which you can see stamped Qualitex on the pad itself. And so dry cleaning customers who wanted Qualitex pads expected to receive pads in this Qualitex green color. Uh, Jacobson was a competitor, it entered the dry cleaning market and it started producing dry cleaning pads in a similar but not identical uh, green color and Qualitex brought a trademark infringement action against Jacobson on the ground that they had a trade dress, uh, trade dra trademark in, uh, in the color of their dry cleaning pads. So the lower courts held that, or rather the Ninth Circuit, uh, rejected Qualitex's uh, claim, which was actually successful in the district court. Ninth Circuit rejected it uh, on legal grounds, holding that color alone could not be a valid mark. In other words, color alone could not communicate information about source to consumers, or maybe more broadly, trademark just didn't protect color alone. And the Supreme Court reversed. It said, no, there's no reason to exclude color or any other product feature for that matter from the scope of trademark protection. If a feature of a product can and does communicate source about to consumers, then that feature can be a can be a trademarked or a trade dress element of the product in question. It doesn't matter what it is. Color is just another feature of a product. And if consumers can infer the source of the product from the color, then the color can be a trademark. Why is that? Jacobson had a bunch of objections, some on policy grounds. Uh, you know, there are only a limited number of colors. How are you going to determine how close or, you know, what, you know, whether they're too similar or not? And the court kind of dismissed all those and said, look, those are factual questions and we can decide them on the facts, but there's no theoretical legal reason why color can't be source indicating. Uh, and as it happens, Qualtex continues, I believe, to make pads in this distinctive, as it were, uh, gray green color. So what did the court say here? It said essentially, look, when it comes to color, it can be protected, but the claimant has to show that the color is in fact communicating information about source to consumers. In other words, the trademark claimant has to show uh, that this descriptive or rather analogous to descriptive mark of color is not just the color the product happens to be, right? But that the color itself actually has acquired secondary meaning and is communicating information about source to consumers. So it kind of analogized to the, uh, to the hierarchy of trademarks, to the Abercrombie factors and said, look, we're gonna place color as a product feature in the descriptive category. And so, you know, it can be a mark, but there's gonna be a burden on the claimant. They're gonna have to show that that color has actually acquired secondary meaning and actually communicates information about source to consumers. Okay, so we can move on then to talk about the uh, 
two pesos case, two pesos v taco cabana. Um, so what happened here? Taco Cabana was a, essentially a Tex-Mex restaurant uh, that opened up stores in, I forgot. Anyway, Taco Cabana had stores, had stores in, in Houston or in, in Texas, uh, opened up a bunch of restaurants and uh, gradually became quite popular. Uh, I've actually driven by a Taco Cabana in uh, New Brownfalls, Texas, not that long ago. No, they're still in, they're still in business and popular today. Um, and uh, they were relatively successful, quite successful in, uh, in that part of Texas. And uh, some years later, uh, another similar Tex-Mex chain opened up uh, nearby, but not in the same geographic area called Two Pesos. And they kind of coexisted for quite some time. And then eventually uh, Taco Cabana moved into the Two Pesos uh, business area and uh, ultimately brought a uh, trade dress infringement action against uh, two pesos. So essentially what Taco Cabana said was, look, we were the first on the market with the particular appearance of our uh, Tex-Mex restaurant and you're second to market. We have the junior, we have the, we have the senior trade dress, you have the junior trade dress and uh, your trade dress is sufficiently similar to ours that it is confusing to consumers. Okay, well, this was litigated and uh, the jury ultimately determined that uh, the Taco Cabana trade dress was inherently distinctive, uh, but had not acquired secondary meaning. Put both questions to the jury, seems like potentially uh, mistaken. But in any case, uh, the jury was asked to categorize whether, uh, you know, kind of where Taco Cabana's trade dress fell on the hierarchy of marks or, or kind of in the, in a sense, the burden that would be placed on Taco Cabana and ultimately said that it was, uh, it was in the inherently distinctive category, uh, but it also made a finding that the Taco Cabana trade dress, in other words, the appearance of the restaurant, did not actually at the time, even after long usage and familiarity, actually communicate information about um, the source or the nature of the restaurant to, to consumers. Uh, and accordingly, uh, Taco Cabana was, was able to proceed. Now, two pesos object on the grounds that these two findings were fundamentally in contradiction with each other, right? If it's inherently distinctive, how can it not have secondary meaning? Well, ultimately the court said, um, that's fine, right? Because inherent distinctiveness is a, in, in a sense, a prediction about uh, whether or not a, uh, a mark or dra trade dress is going to communicate information about source to consumers. And uh, the fact that it doesn't do so yet doesn't mean it might not do so in the future. And if it's inherently distinctive, that's good enough for, for trademark doctrine. And therefore, uh, Taco Cabana can proceed with the claim. And ultimately, two pesos went out of business. And so it doesn't exist anymore, but uh, Taco Cabana does. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Fast forward a little bit to uh, Walmart v. Samara Brothers, uh, returning to the question of, uh, of product design or trade dress, as it were. Uh, uh, Samara Brothers were in the business of making, well, semi-high-end clothing for, for children. Uh, they had a bunch of different customers. Uh, Walmart thought their products essentially were overpriced and took some Samara Brothers products to a one of its own manufacturers in China and asked them to make copies. And lo and behold, uh, they produced something relatively similar. And uh, when Samara Brothers tried to sell to their other customers, the customers were like, well, what do you mean? What are you trying to charge us? You know, Walmart has the same thing for cheaper. And Samara Brothers realized, oh no, Walmart is, is knocking off our products and selling something similar for a lower price. And they brought in an action against, against Walmart. And uh, ultimately, the court held that the uh, that the products uh, were, you know were not inherently distinctive, and uh, and it made a distinction between uh, the the you know the product packaging as it were and uh, the product itself, 
and uh, and pointed out that when it comes to product design, there has to be a showing of of secondary meaning, uh, that there has to be a showing of actual distinctiveness to consumers, uh, unlike product packaging. And it kind of analogized the uh, two pesos uh, restaurant design to product packaging and said, well, that's the distinction between the dresses here and product packaging, where the distinctiveness question is different. When it comes to products themselves, the functionality of the product is, or the appearance of the design of the product is, is bound up in the product itself. And, and therefore, we're going to look for actual uh, distinctiveness, actual secondary meaning, as opposed to finding a permitting a finding of inherent distinctiveness. So query uh, whether the court's distinction between the two cases is actually uh, convincing. Uh, is it possible that uh, Walmart v. Samara Brothers kind of arguably sub rosa overruled or rejected the majority of Taco Cabana? Hard to say, and we can reach it in tomorrow's class.